I'm going to be presenting uh, my talk called Victim as Victimizer, the Ongoing Legacy of Colonization in Teddy Cold Open City. Throughout the three years I have spent at the College of Idaho, I have taken several English courses that have explored both colonial history and the post-colonial movement. My interest in this subject stems from the common presentation of the non-white male in media and literature that I have grown up with. This presentation often characterizes him as a fundamentalist, a terrorist, and as anti-female. However, this man rarely, if ever, speaks for himself, and I know little of his narrative. Historically, what I do know is that the non-white man has traditionally been the target of colonization, as he was humiliated, dominated, and often killed by the colonial powers. This situation was demonstrated repeatedly in the British colonization of India, Egypt, and Africa in the 19th century. Nigerian author Teju Cole's novel, Open City explores what it's like for various non-whites to live within a cosmopolitan space that currently and historically, particularly in the context of colonization, has alienated, targeted, and persecuted them. The narrator of the novel, a half-Nigerian, half-German psychiatry student named Julius, serves as a conduit for these voices as he wanders New York, Nigeria, and Brussels, conversing with people he meets and allowing them to tell their stories. Some of the events discussed in Julius's conversations include the genocide of the Native Americans, the brutal British colonization of Nigeria, the illegal detention of non-white men in New York and the tightening of immigration restrictions, and the Islamic phobic sentences both in the United States and in Europe, particularly with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Interestingly, these experiences are presented not with sympathy, and I would argue that Tedra Cole problematizes the suffering by implying that the post-colonial man is the agent of his own destruction. Teja Cole creates an open city, a post-modern, post-colonial space, in which Julius is able to wander without restrictions and encounter and converse with people from around the world with a depth that's surreal. Some of the people he encounters are a black Liberian man in indefinite detention in, for trying to enter America illegally, an Arab man in an internet cafe in Belgium who talks about Orientalism, Edward Said, the philosophies of Martin Luther King, and the American support of Israel in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, an academic writing about the genocide of the Native American tribe in New York, and a Japanese-American literature professor who was interned in the Minidoka camp in Idaho during World War II. Ironically, Julius notices the strangeness of these conversations, remarking one of the Arab men, Perot's comments on the victimized other, saying, quote, how strange I thought that he used an expression like that in a casual conversation, and yet when he said it, it had a far deeper resonance than it would have in any academic situation, end quote. This suggests that the unrealistic aspect of the narrative adds to its meaning rather than detracts from it. Another remarkable aspect of this postmodern space is that when it comes to the dialogue, Teja Cole forgoes traditional punctuation and line breaks, so that most of the dialogue appears without quotation marks. This method heightens the surreal aspect of the characters, making them extensions of Julius's own narrative. And not only does this postmodern space allow many different characters to speak, particularly non-white males, but it also illustrates the problematic position that non-whites have in the United States, as all these characters have some kind of connection to America, and yet most of them are aware that they are or were the target of America's immense military and imperial power. One of the reoccurring themes in all of these conversations is that the non-white genocides have been forgotten. For example, one of Julius's patients, who he simply refers to as V throughout the novel, is a Native American historian writing a book about the European colonization of America in the 17th century. She meets with Julius due to her severe depression as a result of her research and tells Julius that, quote, there are almost no Native Americans in New York City and very few in all of the Northeast. It isn't right that people are not terrified by this because this is a terrifying thing that happened to a vast population, end quote. Julius is affected by these words such that when he visits the ruins of the Twin Towers, he feels a larger history of destruction. He says, quote, this was not the first erasure on the site. There had been communities here before Columbus ever set sail. Human beings have lived here, built homes, and quarreled with their neighbors, end quote. Similarly, these words echo through Julius when he visits the memorial of a mass burial ground for slaves. He realizes that, quote, the land had been built over and the people of the city had forgotten that it was a burial ground, end quote. Julius goes on to further describe the forgotten or unacknowledged violence that saturated the historical context of the burial ground, saying, quote, the excavated bodies bore traces of suffering, blood trauma, grievous bodily harm, end quote. Julius then goes on to connect New York to its histories as he discusses the early financial growth of New York, illustrating its root in the colonial slave trade, 
trade and acknowledging that several current global corporations were also built upon these profits. Quote, in profiting from slavery, the City Bank of New York was not like other companies. The companies that later became AT&T and Con Edison emerged from the same milieu, end quote. Tejapul connects this violent and dehumanizing past to the present to show that in this liberal and multicultural cosmopolitan space, the non-white man is still an outsider, particularly during times of crisis. This is shown, for example, during one of Julius's conversations with his friend Sato, a literature professor from college who slowly dies from cancer over the course of the novel. Professor Sato is a Japanese American who was interred at the Minidoka camp in Idaho during World War II. Professor Sato talks about this targeting, saying, quote, those of us at the camp were all confused about what was happening. We were American, had always thought ourselves so, and not Japanese, end quote. The, the, this awareness of racial profiling is also present in the Arab man Julius meets in Belgium. Referring to the war of terror for Roque, when Julius invites him to America, says, quote, I have no desire to visit America, and certainly not as an Arab, not now, not with all that I would have to endure there. It was a terrible day, the Twin Towers, terrible, but I understand why they did it, end quote. Teja Cole's novel sub subconsciously references post-colonial theory. One of the theorists who studies co colonialism in Africa was Franz Fanon, who wrote extensively about the targeting of native cultural practices, language, and religious structures by the colonial powers. In his address to a Congress of Black African writers in 1959, later compiled in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, he says, quote, colonial domination, because it is total and tends to oversimplify, very soon manages to disrupt in spectacular fashion the cultural life of a conquered people. This cultural obliteration is made possible by the negation of national reality, by the systematic enslaving of men and women, end quote. Tejo Cole is also echoing Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe in recognizing how Nigeria was fragmented by colonization and how their cultural history was reduced to a footnote. Amitav Ghosh, a post-colonial anthropologist, and William Dalrymple, a historian working with Indian archival material, are, like Tejo Cole, attempting to unearth lost histories. The problem that all three of these men recognize is that the post-colonial man has learned to devalue himself. For example, William Dalrymple discusses how, even in 2004, nobody had studied the Indian Sukhoi mutiny using the original documents from the Mughal Empire, saying that, quote, I have been working through many of the 20,000 virtually unused Persian and Urdu documents relating to Delhi in 1857, known as the mutiny papers, that we found on the shelves of the National Archives of India, end quote. What I find interesting about Open City is that although Julius converses in great detail with many non-whites, Julius is half white and his relationship with other non-white people is often tense. In fact, he rejects any attempt by non-whites, whether black, brown, or Nigerian, to welcome him into their brotherhood. Additionally, at the end of the novel, Julius reveals that he raped a female friend named Moji while in school in Nigeria. Moji, who is fully, fully black, confronts him about the incident years later. Moji shows up over and over and over again in the novel, and I would argue that this is actually not Julius's but Moji's story, because she appears not as a victim, but as an assertive and powerful woman who never feels ashamed. In fact, when Moji is confronting Julius about the rape, he starts speaking about himself in her words, saying, quote, I had forced myself on her, I had acted like I knew nothing about it, and had never tried to acknowledge what I had done, end quote. Julius's interactions with Moji are fragmented throughout the novel, culminating in the revelation of the rape. However, the chapter ends with Moji's narrative regarding the rape, and Julius does not refute or support her story. I am left wondering why Teju Cole, the author, gives Moji the space in the novel to talk about her pain, but doesn't let Julius acknowledge his part in that pain. In fact, a new chapter begins right after Moji tells her story, and Julius attends a symphony of Mahler's music where he experiences a deep connection to the Germ German music. However, the novel also makes clear particularly through the female narratives, that Julius's approval, or anybody's approval for that matter, is not necessary for a story to have power. Moji does not need Julius's approval to make her story powerful. The fact that she is allowed to speak is remarkable in itself, and it is an affirmation of her right and right and of her voice and right to self-determination. Even when Moji tells Julius of the daily pain she experiences, saying, quote, the luxury of denial had not been possible for her. She had thought of me either fleetingly or in extended agonies, for almost every day of her adult life, end quote. I would argue that this statement is Moji's personal verification of her pain and does not require Julius's acknowledgement or remorse to make it valid. V, the Native American historian, ends up committing suicide because she is overwhelmed by the loss she discovers in her research. However, she
She dies only after her book is published, which gives her voice and those of the countless Native Americans slaughtered in the British colonization of America a permanent place within academic discourse. While these stories, and in fact all the narratives throughout Open City, do not suggest that these various wounds can or even have to be healed, the fact that the narratives are being spoken at all makes them powerful. These post-colonial characters are in various states of destruction, but they are also in various states of reconstruction and healing, because Julius takes the time to listen to and to recognize their voices, even if that space is complicated by his unsympathetic reflections on them. While the novel leaves us with no easy answers, that very fact prevents us from flattening these incredibly complex characters. They cannot be defined simply as terrorists or as insurgents. For me, the realm of post-colonial studies has been particularly valuable for that very reason. I'm reali realizing that this representation of the other, particularly the non-white male, that I have grown up seeing in the media and in traditional British literature, is not only an oversimplified representation, but also a dehumanizing.